I'm Christian. Um, I'm going to run through some accessibility testing, uh, mainly what I look for when I'm testing and how easy it can be. Um, I think the really important thing uh, that a lot of people forget is that uh, testing how accessible your site is doesn't mean just keeping in mind people who can't hear or can't see. It's actually everyone. It's uh, devices, it's whether or not they have a mouse, it's um, whether or not they use IE. I know that sucks, um, but you need you need to you know you need to consider all these people. Um, I actually need to sit down to do this because I'm going to be doing lots of driving, but I'll, uh, I'll I'll speak up. All right. So when I test a site, um, there's pretty much three things you need to to test. There's three stages. Uh, reason is that each one won't give a thorough enough testing on its own. Um, initially. What I'll do is I'll go through and use uh, some form of tool to test the code. Um, problem with that is it's not entirely accurate. It'll give you an idea of missing tags and attributes without going through the source, which is really nice. But it won't uh, take context into account. So for example, if we use the wave toolbar for errors, we see there's actually an error here for the form label missing. We don't actually have a form there. Um, we have a form select which is used for the responsive. So when we go small, we actually get this box here. Um, screen readers read it because it has a title. We don't actually need a label there. Um, it's just a, uh, an example of where uh, validating the code is, isn't necessarily um, going to give you a fail-safe result. So what's, uh, the, what's the tool you're using to get that? Uh, this is the WAVE toolbar. Web, uh, the, Web AIM, so Web Accessibility Initiative something. Um, the Wave toolbar, it's, it's probably the, the best accessibility toolbar, at least that I've used. Um, so this just goes through, it, it gives us a little green when we've done the right thing. Um, and it's obviously a whole lot faster than going through and checking that alt tags exist. Uh, the other thing we do um, when testing is uh, to check for um, landmarks on the page. Now, this isn't, necessary, uh, isn't totally necessary because um, having landmarks isn't actually WCAG criteria, but um, it is worthwhile to see whether or not these landmarks exist because it's, uh, they're very simple to add and they add uh, a lot of functionality for people using screen readers. Um, the last part with uh, generally with the code checking um, is to go through and check that uh, links and text can be read by everyone. And basically, there is a, uh, a ratio of uh, contrast that, that must be met, which is 4.5 to 1, which is background to foreground color. Um, and you can actually just get something like a color picker uh, to grab a color on the page. And then just use something like. Um, a color checker, which is, I mean, these guys are, is available. It's just an add-on for Firefox. Oops. And that'll tell us just here what the ratio is, just to make sure that, uh, that the foreground and background uh, do uh, reach a certain contrast. I actually opened this. This is a site that my... Um, <laughs> My tutor at uni um, drew us to as an example of, of the worst uh, accessible site they'd ever seen. If you, if you look at the top, you, this is actually a menu here. Um, and, and over here we have a link needing appraisal. Um, I, I'm not going to start, but I mean, there are so many areas. Um, there's 10 accessibility errors. It, this won't pick up a lot of errors because most of this site is actually built on images. So that's another example of it needing uh, needing a personal um, test. Um, it is something else, though. Um, the next thing I do when testing a site is to see how well it can be navigated using a keyboard. Um, the uh, I mean that's one one thing that we need to be able to do, both for screen readers and for people who just don't have a mouse. Um, so just trying to find out how easily it, you can get to certain parts of the site um, without actually touching the mouse, which uh, a lot of the time can be quite tricky. 
Um, now, I was hoping this microphone would work because the last part I was going to show you was uh, actually using a screen reader, but you guys aren't actually going to be able to. I don't know if anyone can hear that. So, he reads me stories when I go to bed. So this is, this is um, something that everyone's got access to this. You've got Mac, um, VoiceOver's already installed. It's, 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 it's pretty tricky to learn. Um, no, it won't listen to me. It'll just keep reading what's on the screen. Yeah, yeah, you can tell it. The, it's all keyboard control. There's different ways to control it. Um, if you're on Windows, there's, there's a screen reader called NVDA. Um, there's, there's plugins for Chrome. There's so many ways to, uh, to get screen readers to work. And one of the things we had to do for uni last year was to cover our screens and navigate our company website using only whatever screen reader we had. Um, and it's, it's a very, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's an experience that, that a lot of people should do and just don't think about doing. Um, to get an idea of what people who can't see have to do to, uh, to navigate the sites and making sure that everything can be accessible. Um, this, uh, this site actually uses landmarks, which I wanted to show um, just really quickly, which just makes it really easy for accessible technology to, um, to navigate the page without having to, I mean, you saw what I was doing before to try to tab through a site. It, it, takes a long time to get, if you're trying to get to the footer, if you try to tab through eBay, for example, <laughs> Lord have mercy, that, it's, just to get to the first listing, it's, it's, it's horrendous, so, oh, is he irritating you? He's, actually, I'll turn it back on just for one second. So, one thing I just wanted to show was landmarks, basically, which is just when you add a roll to an element, um, so all your wrappers, uh, on the page you can add a role to and it makes it really really easy for people to go through and uh, and get to get to different parts of the site without having to touch the keyboard very often um, so yeah that's that's it that's um I mean this is by no means a uh, in depth this is how you make sure a site's accessible um, but It'll give you an idea of, of just things you need to look out for. And like I said, it's, it's not just people who can't see and can't hear, it's everyone. Um, you know, regardless of device, regardless of technology, um, they need to be able to get to the content. And if it means giving them a, a dumbed down version of the site so that they can access it uh, on, you know, IE6, <laughs> IE5, whatever they've got, then, then sometimes we need to think about doing that. Um, so that's it for me. If there's any questions, hit me up. accessible places on a on a project in terms of time or budget um, or something it really depends on what you're doing um, some sites if there's lots of dynamic content for example um, can be really tricky um, and that will take a long time not only to test but to devise solutions that still look pretty and and maintain design um, but people can interact with um, doing a site like uh, the previous next site pretty straightforward because there's not a great deal of moving content um, and everything is pretty well defined in blocks on the page. Um, so to do a check, uh, I don't know how, much, how long I've spent, uh, two or three hours maybe to test a site like Previous Next um, and then to, to, if you can get the test done before site, goes, before site is complete, um, then there's nothing you need to retouch again. And that's really important, making sure you do it while the themers are still playing with it. Um, because if it gets complete and then they have to go back and change things again because you've kicked up mud, which is going to happen, um, then your overheads are much bigger than they need to be. Um, it's really important to get involved in accessibility testing at the design stage if you can, because you can at least spot things like colour, um, contrast.
Kim Trump to you, Rob. <laughs> I was going to say as well, um, how does, I guess, HTML5 markup affect some of the accessibility things? Like you, you showed ARIA landmarks there. Um, is there support for uh, HTML5 like section? And yeah, um, it, it, that really comes down to uh, the assistive technology you're using. Obviously, something like um, JAWS is likely to handle that kind of stuff much better than something like NVDA, which is open source. Um, the majority uh, of uh, assistive apps, such as VoiceOver and JAWS, handle the roles, and they will handle like section markup, um, but generally a mix of the two to make, make sure it's, you know, it can be handled by everything is the way to go. Uh, you just had to assume that you couldn't use JavaScript on a site because assistive technologies yep. can't read it. Is that still the case, or is it no? No. So most Java, well, again, it depends on the app that you're using, application you're using. Um, but uh, the majority of JavaScript can be read. Um, it really depends on how it's being presented and how it's being marked up. Um, uh, there's also ARIA uh, markup for JavaScript that changes on a site, so that the screen read will actually get an alert. Um, when content on the site changes. Um, very easy to add and, uh, and makes a big difference. Yes, just, just some comments. Um, just one, I think one of the biggest accessibility flaws that you'll, or that I've personally been reprimanded for <laughs> is, um, <laughs> is uh, you know, like a lot of times you have these drop down navs and you won't be able to tab through them. You should saw in the previous next set how that's happening. Um, the, the best way to fix that is Superfish, um, is Superfish dropdowns. Uh, the normal one, the normal library doesn't come with, isn't accessible. You have to get the, the, one that, the one that in the Drupal module is accessible. So if you go into their module and just steal their JavaScript, if you're gonna implement it yourself or just use the, the Drupal Superfish module, that's a great way to have those dropdown um, accessibility and just, to comment on JavaScript being accessible, whether or not to use it. That select that we got an error on was added by JavaScript. It looks at the menu and then creates a select. It's using a, a JavaScript library. So that just proves yeah. that not only do you have to have your HTML be accessible, but also your JavaScript that renders HTML also needs to be accessible. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I was wondering, um, What's your recommendation for checking accessibility on a continuing basis for actual content pages? Since most of us are working in content management systems, you have editors that are constantly editing and adding pages. Yep. Um, those techniques you showed are great for you know, testing your structure and your theme and your menus and stuff, but what do you do about like, you know, the body of a page where an editor might do something really stupid and yep. not you know, make something that's not accessible? How do you... So one thing that we've implemented uh, with, with the AGOV distribution is to do nightly checks of new content. So we've got a validator service set up that just does the code checks. Um, can't really do much more than that, at least at the moment. Uh, so any content that's changed gets run against that nightly with a report the next day. Um, I'm actually also building a module at the moment which allows you to validate a preview of a node. So once you've added all your content, hit preview, and then you've got a validate button. Um, it's a little bit tricky at the moment because it's not exactly what's going to be on the page, but it gives you a general idea um, of what's missing. Um, there are ATAG guidelines, which is uh, Authoring Tools Accessibility Guidelines, I think it, what it is. Um, and that all goes into how to make authoring tools be able to produce accessible content. Um, and for the most part, that's, it's only partially s successful because the people who are using it um, don't provide enough in terms of markup through the WYSIWYG when doing it. Yeah. Um, I guess bringing it back to Drupal, is there a good starting point or say a theme starting point that is more accessible than most? Um, how much of it happens at the theme layer? How much of it happens in modules, selection, configuration, that kind of thing? Almost all of it happens in the theme. Um, for the most part, I don't do a great deal of the fixes at least at the moment. Poor saps like Robert has to deal with 
the hundreds of tasks that. Zen, Zen module has, they pioneered the skip to content link and they have, I mean, uh, John Albin's like really up to date on all the accessibility. So if you want to have an accessible start and a lot of access, uh, documentation on accessibility, read through the Zen, the Zen theme and use the Zen module, the Zen theme for, as a base. It's great for that. <laughs> I was going to say, one of the other things that um, I noticed didn't contrib, at least now, there's definitely a lot more emphasis on accessibility, and there's plenty of modules where I've seen accessibility fixes go in, so things like Webform used to be really bad at, at accessibility, and, and the latest version is actually uh, fully compliant, and I think it's just a case of people filing tickets on those contrib issues and providing patches and basically saying, if you if you fix this, it'll be an accessible module. I think people are much more aware of it these days. Yeah. Yep. Phil? Thanks, guys.